Tudum. A pleasant morning to all of you, to our dear instructor, Mr. Julio Ahero, and to you, dear classmates. So for our subject this morning is readings in the Philippine history. So let's get started. Our topic for today is all about the riders of the Sulu Sea, and the description for this is that it is a historiography documentary film focusing on Zamboanga City, depicting how the Spaniards defended the city with the Fort Pillar as Spain's last stronghold and bastion of defense, and economic expansion in the south of the Philippines. And before we start our report, we would like to thank and acknowledge the producers of the said 1996 documentary. The first is Zohurira Banuko Delhi, Lim Swat Yet, and Jason Lai. They co-produced a document with Discovery Asia titled, The Gods Must Be Hungry, which earned Discovery Asia's highest viewership in 10 years. So let us proceed to the first chapter, The Riders of the Sulu Sea. The Riders of the Sulu Sea, it is a historical documentary film depicting the Southeast Asia flourishing free trading in the area, adverse effects, retaliation when Spaniards wanted to control the economy as well to colonize and Christianize. In the 16th century, Spaniards colonized Zamboanga because of its geographical advantage that made it valuable to the Catholic Spaniards. To protect their interests, the Spanish built forts to discourage potential invaders. Tudum. In history, they were regarded as ruthless savages, courageous slave raiders, and above all, pirates. The Ilanun, Bulangini Samal, and Tausug tribes, who originated in the Seleucid region of the Philippines, raided and plundered settlements in the Philippines, Borneo, Java, the Straits of Malacca, and all over Southeast Asia. In search of human cargo to feed the slave trade's growing demands from the 16th to 19th centuries. Zamboanga was colonized by Spaniards in the 16th century due to its geographical advantage, which made it useful to the Catholic Spaniards. To preserve their interest, the Spaniards construct fortifications to prevent possible attackers. December 8, 1720, they launched a bloody attack on Fort Pilar in Zamboanga City, along with Raja de Lisi. They attacked Zamboanga burned the town around the fort, cut the supply lines for the Spaniards, and started a war against the soldiers inside the fort. Taking the fort would be a difficult task for Raja de Lassi and his warriors. The fort is built to withstand even the most damaging cannonballs. Spanish artillery lines protected every potential access to the fort. Yet even with these defenses and firepower, Spanish forces were vastly outnumbered. Raja de Lassi and his troops only had their swords to fight against the Spaniards, cannons, and fargons. The Spaniards are so determined to defend that they attack the riders with boulders and boiling water as they ascend the fort's walls. Raja de Lassi and his fighters are driven by a desire to liberate Zamboanga from the Spanish. The fort pillar serves as a checkpoint for slave riders traveling to and from the north. Riders are keen to eliminate the Spaniards' presence for these reasons. Some historians said that slave riding had been practiced among some tribes in the Philippines before Western powers arrived. The arrival of the Spanish and their desire to dominate trade in the region triggered an escalation in slave riding. So the first chapter of the, of the report has been finished. Now, let us proceed to the next episode. Chapter 2, the, th the Three Muslim Tribes. It is composed of the Samal Balanini tribe, the Ilanun tribe, and the Tausug tribe. Both the Ilanuns and the Samal Balanini were long-established seafaring communities. They frequently band together with the Tausug, a, ta a tribe with no maritime experience but a reputation for fierce warriors and widespread political power. When Ilanuns kidnapped people, they would bore a hole in their victim's palm and string through each person's palm. Three different Muslim tribes who challenged Spanish authority 
throughout its occupancy and reigned during the 17th century. Riders of the Seleucid. The first tribe are the Samal Balangini. As an ethnic group compromised of pirates and their captives, and their continued sense of belonging to the island, a uh, stronghold of Balangini. Even after its inhabitants were forcibly resettled between 1848 to 1858, they occupied the chain of the islands between Basilan and Sulu Island. Samal Balangini of the Sulu Mindanao region, they specialized the state sanctioned maritime raiding, attacking Southeast Asian coastal settlements and trading vessels. The second tribe are the Ilanun. Ilanun is a Malay term meaning pirate is appropriate for the people of this ethnic group, who were once regarded as the fiercest pirates in the Malay area. Very important in the piracy history, known as fierce in marine forests in the Sultanate, they are nothing but barbaric for the Western colonists. And the third and last tribe are the Tausug. Tausugs are gen generally known to be seafarers and fierce maritime warriors. Tao means people, and so means currents. Hence, we carry the moniker People of the Current. Known for its fierce warriors and widespread political powers, controls the Sulu Sultanate in the south lineage of Rahas. Ta -dum. Historians question whether the riders in the southern Philippines should be called pirates. Were they out for personal gain? or were they simply serving their local political ma masters? According to the historian, Professor Barbara Watson Andaya said, all books that talk about piracy deal with the problem of terminology. Using the word English word pirate is actually misleading in some respects because it doesn't cover raiders. It doesn't cover people who act on behalf of the state. This Philippine Moros, the raids to the north, in the Spanish force attack were an act of retaliation, the foreign occupier. The Sultanate also sanctioned most of these raids in the name of an even higher course, Islam. And according to the historian Dr. Julius Bautista, he said that there was certainly a great deal of pressure from the South for population in the Visayas to become Islamized. <clears throat> but the presence of the Spanish in the Visayas and Southern Luzon disrupted the spread of Islam. The Spanish colonial administrators thought it was their responsibility to prevent the spread of Islam from the south to the Christianized population in the north. For the Muslim Sultanates, eradicating the presence of Christian Spanish in Zamboanga was one of their top priorities. Both sides used their ideology to spread its influence. The second chapter of the report has been finished. Now, let us continue to the next episode, Chapter 3, Vessels and Weapons the Riders Used. The three vessels the riders used are the Lanong, Garay, and Salisipan. <clears throat> so, in Butuan City is a small town in Mindanao's northernmost province. They discovered signs of marine civilization in the pond in 1977. Artifacts discovered with carbon dating testify to a maritime culture that lived in this 4th century. Seafarers have had their navigational skills since the dawn of time. The doom. Southern Filipino seafarers who assisted them in developing a thriving trade in the sea's riches. The ships grew into a sturdier, more seaworthy boat by the mid 1700s. Increased slave demand flowed into a situation by the mid 18th century when something absolutely unprecedented happened in the Malacca Street region. And that was the seasonal entrance of very large numbers of pirates from the southern Philippines. That is what Professor Barbara Watson and Daya explained. The first vessel that were used by the riders is the Lanong ship. Lanong were large outrigger warships used by the Iranun and the Bangini people of the Philippines, and it is also considered the biggest ship. The Lanong can reach up to 30 meters or 98 feet long and 6 meters or 20 feet wide amidships. 
they were crewed by up to 150 to 200 men, led by a panglima or so-called commander. Unlike the similar Karakowa, the Lanong were heavily armed specifically for naval battles. The pro jutted past the keel into a big head that also mounted a long gun or so-called lela and several swivel guns or so-called nantaka. Lanong had two bat shear masts which were considered of two spars slashed together at the top in contrast to the more common tripod mast used in other maritime Southeast Asian native ships. They were rigged with tanja sails. Their bases can partially revolve, which allow them to be raised or lowered as needed. They are frequently used as ladders for burning enemy vessels or for disembarking the crew on shores. A rectangular banner with the standard of the Panglima was flown from the stern. Like in Karakowa, Lanong had decks above the rowers and on both sides of the outriggers for accommodating warriors and for fighting. These platforms were defended by rows and thick shields. Rowers, who were all galley sleeves, were all housed inside the main hall with none stationed on the outriggers. The oars were arranged into one to three banks on each side, one on top of the other, like the Garay and Penahap, the Nong usually served as mother ships, the smaller Salisipan war canyons. <clears throat> the next vessel is the Garay. Garay were traditional native warships of the Bagini people in the Philippines. In the 18th and 19th centuries, they were commonly used for piracy by the Bagini and Iranan people against unarmed trading ships and raids on coastal settlements in the region surrounding the Sulu Sea. It is the fastest and can carry to 60 to 80 men depending on size. <clears throat> the Rai were smaller, faster, and more maneuverable than the Ilanun Lanong warships. They had a much broader beam and somewhat round hull with a shallow draft. They had a single tripod main mast made three of made of three bamboo poles which was rigged with a large rectangular sail with tilted upper corners or so-called alayar tanha. <coughs> Ta -dun. They also had a foremast and sometimes a mizzen mast which were rigged with smaller triangular club claw sails. When the wind was heavy, the main sail was lowered and only the foresail and the mizzen sails were set. Large Garai could have around 30 to 60 oars, usually arranged into two banks, one on top of the other. They were rowed by either people belonging to the Alipin caste or by captured slaves. The hull was partially or fully decked. The deck was made of slit bamboo slats divided into square sections that could be removed as required. Most of the length of the ship was covered by the house-like structure roofed with nipa leaves. A raised platform over a clay stove was used for cooking. At the sides of the hull were overhanging catwalks about 1 to 2 feet or 0 0.30 to 0 0.61 meters in width. The ship did not have a central rudder but had two string steering oars located near the steering. The largest garai were around 70 to 80 feet, 21 to 24 meter long and could carry up to 80 men. But most garai average at 60 to 80 feet, 18 to 21 meter, with around 60 men. The last ship vessel that was used is the Salisipan. <clears throat> the Salisipan resemble a long and narrow banka that sit low on the water. They are propelled by rowers, steered by an oar at the stern, and are light enough to be hauled as oar. It is the smallest and mostly used in checking or monitoring coastal areas. It is used by the riders when they are near in the shore and pretend to be harmless fishermen. Salisipan are long and narrow war canoes, with or without outriggers. If the Iranun and Bangini people of the Philippines, they were mainly used for piracy and for raids on coastal areas. Salisipan resemble a long and narrow banka that sit low on the water.
They are propelled by rowers, steered by an oar at the stern, and are light enough to be hauled as oar. They are typically equipped with woven shields of nipa that could be propped along the sides to protect the rowers against arrows. They are sometimes also known by the more general term vinta, baroto, or kakap. Salisipan auxiliary vessels that accompany larger motherships like Panjahava, Garay, and Lanong. Their presence was usually indicative of a larger raiding fleet nearby. An historian, Isa Gloria B. Estrada, said, When they leave the shore on skeleton force, they pass by other bases and augment the labor into the ship. Then when they reach the coast, they usually hide their big boots because it can be seen from the shore. So they use the salisipan, the smaller vessel, to arrow into the shorelines and pretend they are fishermen and harmless people. Now let us progress to a subtopic entitled the Maritime Civilization. Proof of a maritime civilization is based on 1977 archaeological findings from Butuan and is built seaworthy vessels navigated by adept sailors in a labor-intensive economy that bartered birds, nest, tripang, and pearls. Slave riding, selling, and distribution were all regarded part of international trade in Southeast Asia because slaves serves as gatherers, rowers, and helpers. When Ilanuns caught somebody, they drilled a hole in the palm of their victim's hand and treaded a stream through it. The rider's secret weapon against the Spanish is the ships, because the Spanish don't have ships that can match the rider's speed. Let us proceed to another subtopic, the weapons used by the raiders of the Seleuci. The first weapon is called the Barong. It is usually used in a close counter battle, used in close combat battle to cut the Spanish firearms down. It is also known as the Sword of the Prophet Du Alfihar, was originally the name of one of the personal weapons of Prophet Muhammad, which later belonged to his son-in-law, Ali. Following Muhammad's death, Du Alfihar attained legendary status, its ownership conferring legitimate temporal and spiritual power. The Barong is a type of sword unique to the Islamized peoples for the southern Philippines, the Moros. It is distinguished by a heavy single-edged blade of elliptical shape and a gracefully curved pommel that resembles the stylized head of a kahauto or parrot. The finely carved ivory pommel, silver grip, and plentiful silver inlay decorating the blade of this barong suggests that it was not intended for use in battle but rather a sign of social status. <clears throat> the second weapon is called Kalis. It was built a weapon of warfare and ceremony. The reason for its wearing is for easy slashing. This is a type of double-edged Filipino sword, open with a wavy section. The Kalis has a double-edged blade, which is commonly straight from the tip but wavy near the handle. Kalis with fully straight or fully wavy blades also exists. It is similar to the Japanese Karis, but differs in that the Kalis is a sword, not a dagger. It is much larger than the Karis and has a straight or slightly curved hilt, making it primarily a heavy slashing weapon in contrast to the stabbing pistol grip of the Karis. <coughs> um, the wavy portion of the Kalis is said to be meant to facilitate easier slashing in battle, since a straight edge tends to get stuck on the opponent's bones, the wavy portion allows the calluses better to more easily pull the weapon out of his opponent's body. And for the last weapon, it is called the Kampilan. It is the longest and used by the Ilanuns and Samal Balangin. Sulo of Mindanao warriors wield these dual-pointed swords with sculpted hilts. The Kampilan is Sulu in Mindanao's national weapon. Depending on the fighting skill levels of the Kampilan welder, a single winging motion, similar to a baseball bat swing, can cut off two or even three heads cleanly. That is precisely what these swords were made for. It is thought to be the Filipino warrior's longest traditional sword to date, 
During the Spanish Constantadors occupancy of the Philippines from 1565 to 1898, the Campilan was the most well-documented sword. <clears throat> the third chapter of the report has been completed. Now let us progress to the last episode, Chapter 4, Flotilla of a Hundred Ships. A flotilla, from Spanish meaning a small flota or fleet of ships, or naval flotilla. It is a formation of small warships that may be part of a larger fleet. Now, let me introduce to you the subtopic for this chapter, the Fort del Pilar. It is a 10-meter high fortress and sprawled over two erks. One of the most celebrated attacks on the Fort Pilar is the 1720 attack by Maguindanao King Dalasi, the king of Bulig in Maguindanao at the time. Fort Pilar, father Rivera's masterpiece, was abandoned in 1663, rebuilt in 1718, and was for centuries a defense against Muslim, Dutch, Portuguese, and British attacks. It was in disrepair after World War II until it was restored by the National Museum. The Fort del Pilar, a Spain's last stronghold and bastion of defense and economic expansion in the south of the Philippines, which was occupied by the former on December 8, 1720. It shows the Southeast Asian flourishing free trading in the area and the adverse effects and repercussions with Europeans such as the English, Dutch, and Spanish who wanted to control the economy as well to colonize and Christianize. It focuses on the slave raiding as retaliation on colonizer since it was legal during those times and the sophisticated Asian maritime vessels and tools for war, and the well-organized forces that is plunged for slave raiding, the coast of Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, between July to October, called as the Pirate Wind, Pirate Monsoon. In short, this is the place where the war happened. <clears throat> and the last subtopic for the last chapter of this report is the Sulu in Spanish tongues. Hulu was a slave market in the 18th and 19th century. Panglima Taupan, a Balangini was notorious slave riders. Spain wanted to control maritime trade in Sulu Sea in addition to its goal of Christianizing the population. <coughs> Money and mission together. Tudum. It is claimed that in the 16th century, European colonial powers such as the Portugal and Spain wanted to conquer Southeast Asia in order to, first, control the spice trade which was then driving the world economy, and second, in the words of the Portuguese viceroy, to cast the Moors out of this country, Malacca and quench to far the sect of Muhammad, so that it may never burst out again hereafter. Armed encounters with the Muslim and military expeditions to Mindanao and Borneo, occurred almost as soon as the Spaniards settled in the islands. Historian Cesar Adib Mahul charted six stages of the so-called Moro Wars that took place from the mid-1500s to the 1800s. Among the Spanish mission was the 1578 military expedition in Mindanao, which aimed to have the Moro acknowledged Spanish dominion to establish trade with the Moro and explore and exploit the natural resources of the land, to end Moro piracy and raids against Spanish ships and Christianized settlements and to convert the Moro like the other Philippine groups. The head of the expedition was instructed to squash the preaching of the doctrine of Muhammad since it is evil and false, and that of the Christian alone is good. These guiding principles are said to have held fast and defined Spain's relation to the Moro for the next three centuries. <clears throat> Previously on the Riders of the Sulu Sea, we have discussed and presented four chapters, the Riders of the Sulu Sea, the three Muslim tribes, the vessels and weapons used by the Riders, the flotilla of a hundred ships, the Fort del Pilar, and the Sulu in Spanish times. That is all and thank, thank you, you for listening. listening. I am Lian Jamante. And I am Bea Alianza. Your, Your reporters, reporters for this morning. morning. Officially, officially signing off. off.